songs of gladness, I will sing Jehovah's praises upon a ten-stringed psaltery. And welcome to our service of Holy Eucharist on this, the last Sunday after the Pentecost, Christ the King Day. For information on how you can follow along with the service, please check the description below the video. And now, let us begin. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, for you are set, seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountain of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture in the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 95, 1 through 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth. And the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands have, prepared, have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The second reading is from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all saints, and for all and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and he has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. 
All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, come you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to the people at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you. From the prophet Ezekiel, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock and I will judge between sheep and sheep. In August of 2014, a young man from Ferguson, Missouri, was stopped by a police officer on suspicion of having stolen a box of cigars. The ensuing altercation resulted in numerous bullets, one of which killed Michael Brown. I remember the Ferguson shooting especially because of what I read later about systemic problems in Ferguson's local police practices. According to a Department of Justice report a year after the shooting, Ferguson police and court officials had been systematically and deliberately applying excessive law enforcement tactics in order to generate revenue from the town's mostly black and impoverished residents. The prophet Ezekiel in our reading today accuses the fat sheep of pushing with flank and shoulder against the lean sheep, of butting the weak animals with their horns. This is bullying behavior. And Ezekiel makes it clear that this bullying is a systemic behavior in the flocks which have both fat and lean sheep. 
Fergus's practices against its citizens pitted the fat sheep, the people in legal power, against the lean sheep, the poor, and the people of color. Almost everyone in Fergus's city government and law enforcement participated in the system. This was not one or two rogue cops. Ferguson's patterns of injustice that were exposed in light of Michael Brown's killing introduced me to the concept of systemic problems in criminal justice in the United States. At the time, I was able to compartmentalize, thinking something like, well, that's Ferguson, Missouri, but we're not like that in Ames, Iowa. But listen to the list of abuses the Department of Justice found in Ferguson and think about whether some of them might exist in Iowa. First, traffic tickets. Police officers in Ferguson were highly encouraged and rewarded for increasing how many traffic tickets they issued. They were disciplined for not reaching a quota. Second, fines. Fines were exorbitant and capricious. Over $100 for a parking fine. Around $100 for weeds or tall grass. Other finable offenses included things like manner of walking failure to obey, and failure to comply. Court fines were much higher than neighboring communities for the same things. $125 for failure to appear, $50 for a warrant just to be executed, and 56 cents per mile for the police to drive to serve the warrant. $30 to $60 for each night spent in jail. The municipal court in Ferguson was only in session three days each month. This meant that if a defendant couldn't afford bail, they had to stay in jail until the next court session. It also created an incentive for defendants to plead guilty in order to speed their release. We can see some similar patterns in the experience of an ISU student in Ames. An Iowa State student of color was out at the bars one Friday evening. The student was the designated driver for their group, so didn't order any drinks, though the student did take sips from other people's drinks. Yes, this was before COVID. The group left the bar at closing time, I think around 2 a.m., and went to their car. Everyone got in the car, the driver started up the car, and began to pull out. They were stopped immediately by a police officer who had been waiting. The offense was expired tags. The student had the new tags in the car. They had been difficult to attach, perhaps because the license plate was dirty, so the student had put off attaching them. The officer then asked the student to take a breathalyzer test. Now the student knew from a friend's experience that if you refuse a breathalyzer, you can automatically lose your license for a year. So the student took it. It registered 0.084%. The student was charged with an OWI, operating while under the influence, and taken to jail. The OWI charge became part of the state records. Was the student targeted because of color? Maybe, but it's impossible to be sure. It was probably an arrest that was made under false pretenses, since there was never a charge for displaying no tags. This does suggest that officers in Story County may have quotas of tickets that they are supposed to give out, or that they may be rewarded when they ticket more people. It turns out that also, that breathalyzers are supposed to be calibrated once a month, though many states only require once every two months. The one used in Ames in this student's case had not been calibrated in well over a year. Missing a month may be a mistake, but missing calibration for over a year seems like negligence at best. Had it been calibrated, it would have registered below 0.08 and there would have been no case. But this is not the end of the story. The charges were not dismissed with this revelation. Instead, the student was offered a plea deal of wet and reckless. The punishment was a fine and a year-long probation with driving privileges only to and from work. The student could have still pleaded innocent but was encouraged not to by their lawyer. A guilty plea brings an end, or so the student probably thought, to the uncertainty. Fighting it could end up with a worse punishment, a larger fine, or a jail sentence. So the student paid a fine and got on with life, or at least tried to get on with life. The student graduated and left Ames, but it turns out the records accessed by employers, landlords, and the like are the DMV records, not the court records. The DMV records don't change. 
So the charge of OWI is what the landlords and employers reviewed for this student. Finding housing and jobs is not easy when you have an OWI record, as this student learned. When I started to see through this student's experience that it is even in my wonderful hometown that we have simple misdemeanor experiences, being caught without displaying current tags on your license plate, and they can have a lot of snowballing effects. These effects are all part of a system. People are arrested because the system may give merits to police officers for issuing tickets. Crawling out from under an arrest is complicated and frequently just too difficult. Pleading guilty is often easier. Alexandra Natapoff writes in her book, Punishment Without Crime, one of the great myths of our criminal justice system is that minor arrests and convictions are not especially terrible for people who experience them. But misdemeanor punishments are not petty at all. People with minor arrests and convictions are jailed, fined, supervised, tracked, marked, and stigmatized. They can lose their jobs, their driver's licenses, their welfare benefits, child custody, immigration status, and housing. They may be disqualified for loans and professional licenses or sink into debt and ruined credit. Sometimes these hap things happen even when their cases are dismissed and they are never convicted at all. Ezekiel says that God will set over the sheep one shepherd, God's servant David, and he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. This shepherd will be a prince among God's flock. This shepherd is David's descendant, the Messiah, God's promised one. In the Gospel of Matthew, we likewise read that Jesus speaks of one who will come, the Son of Man, who will sit on his throne of glory, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep seem to be like the lean sheep in Ezekiel, and the goats seem to be like the fat sheep. Jesus says that the king separates the people and tells one group that they have inherited the kingdom that has been prepared for them. The king then tells the people the reason why they are inheritors of God's kingdom. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. The people were baffled and asked, When did we do these things, Lord? And he answered them, As often as you have done them to the least of these who are members of my family, you have done it to me. I have read these words ever since I became a Christian. They are words that point to peacemaking and reconciliation. But how do we really do them? How do we get involved doing the big work of God? How do we avoid becoming goats or fat sheep? How do we become one of the sheep who inherits the kingdom? I'll tell you another story. This is about a parishioner at St. John's who found some answers to these questions. He was someone to whom the Son of Man could truly say, I was in prison and you visited me. When I met him, Don Pear was already a deacon at St. John's and the chaplain at Story County Jail. He also became, not long after I met him, a founder of the Matthew 25 house, which is home to men who have recently been released from prison. But it's not like Don woke up one morning and suddenly became all these big things. It took time. Don was a lawyer here in Ames for decades, a career that lasted until he was 80. In the 1990s, he went through a process we have in the Episcopal Church to become a deacon. The process involves discernment, prayer, and study, and can actually take a few years. Once he became a deacon, there were more years of faithful work as he gradually took on that hardest of ideas from Matthew 25, to visit those in prison. One of the ways Don volunteered early on was with an organization called Gideon's International. They are a group that gives away Bibles throughout the world. One of his Gideon friends was the chaplain at Story County Jail. This friend invited Don to join a Bible study at the county jail each week, which Don did for several years. Then, when his friend, the chaplain, retired from the chaplaincy, 
John was invited to become chaplain at the jail himself. Now, Story County Jail is the same jail that the ISU student I talked about earlier went to, that the student who wasn't actually over the limit, but was accused of being over the limit. So it might be helpful here to remind ourselves that not everyone who ends up in jail actually did what they were accused of. A county jail is the place people go to when they are accused, not convicted. Some people are there just overnight, others for several days or a week, a month, a few months, maybe even as much as a year. Some are guilty of terrible crimes. Many are guilty of things any one of us has done without being caught or ticketed. So the people served by the chaplaincy have a wide, wide range of backstories. For years, Don devoted every Sunday evening to leading three services at the jail, two separate men's services and one service for the women. He also spent time getting to know individual inmates, meeting them one-on-one -on -one and writing them letters. He even kept up with them after they left Story County Jail. The faithfulness of Don's work is what made his work so meaningful, week after week, year after year. If we want to do some kind of meaningful work for God, I think that kind of faithfulness matters hugely. But what is also amazing is to see how all the pieces of Don's secular and parish work came together over the years. Don's ongoing relationship with the inmates led him to realize that the journey of an incarcerated person is not over when they are released. Re-entry into society is a particularly difficult time for many who have been in jail or in prison. Because of this, Don decided that he wanted to start a Matthew 25 house, a house where a small group of formerly incarcerated men could find a safe space to live while trying to get on their feet again. It took several years of work from both Don and his wife, Jan. They raised up financial support and found people to serve on a board of directors. Don started with St. John's and then gathered other donations and volunteers from four more supporting churches. Don's work as a lawyer was invaluable in helping the board of directors set the new program up as a nonprofit, in making agreements with the state and the judicial system, and setting up an application and interview process. In 2007, the Matthew 25 house in Ames was opened. Once the house opened, Don led a Bible study there each week. He brought one of the men with him to St. John's. Dan McGonigal became one of us while he was living at the house. The Matthew 25 house continues to be a safe home to a small group of men and a house director while these men get back on their feet. Don was ready to do something for God when he became a deacon. His work took small but faithful steps, volunteering with the Gideons, going to Bible study in the jail, eventually taking on the role of chaplain, meeting with groups each week, writing letters, meeting with individual inmates, drawing up and executing a plan for a ministry to newly released prisoners. In Matthew 25, the king tells us, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But the king doesn't tell them to go out and do magnificent things. He tells us to do small things, to give the hungry something to eat to give the thirsty something to drink, to welcome strangers, to give away clothing, to visit the sick, and to visit those who are in jail. I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a particularly difficult year for our nation. From an asteroid that came within 240 miles of Earth, to a pandemic that fills our lives with uncertainties, to horrible racist killings that have brought us face to face with our worst selves, we are at a crossroads as a nation, as a church, as a parish, and as individuals. The question is, how can we move forward when the future is so murky? How can we be ready to do the work God has for us? A small group of us met with Ama Kim over the summer to consider these questions. We did some reading and discussing, and we decided that in order to be ready for whatever God has in store for us, some of us need to learn more and pray more so that God can lead us forward in some way. Our summer discussions led us to a program called Sacred Ground Dialogue Circles, which we have just begun. Our first round of dialogue circles has gotten started with about 28 participants. This is a 10 session series that we will tackle over the next many months. We will report back as time goes on and if you want to participate, we plan to run new sessions in the future. 
I find the dual image of this morning's lessons to be fascinating. Our God is a shepherd and he is a king. I grew up in Wyoming where we had herds of sheep grazing the mountain ranges in the summer. The shepherds were strong, hardworking people who dressed in work clothes and boots, basically camped out and cooked over campfires all summer long as they led their flocks from one pasture to another. Shepherds and kings couldn't have been more different in my mind. Hard scrabble shepherds were nothing like the image I had of kings who wore fancy clothes and had servants doing their work. But this is the image God has given us. His servant, David, or the son of man, is both a rough and tireless shepherd seeking good pasture for his flock and a king, a great king above all, separating the sheep from the goats. It is both this king and this shepherd who wants us to go out and feed the hungry and visit those in prison. So come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith together by reciting the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people. Jesus the Christ, you reign in glory as our King and we lift our voices in prayer saying, Lord, hear our prayer, that we may serve God with gladness and generosity, discovering his likeness in those who hunger and thirst, in those who are threadbare and in prison, and in those who are sick, lonely, depressed, sorrowful, rejected. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the forgiveness of our sins, the times when we were blind to the needs of others, and deaf to their shout for assistance, that we may move beyond our selfish greed and love with the measure that Jesus loves humanity. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That the leaders of our church may receive the immeasurable greatness of God, seeking the holy way with every step they take, guiding the faithful and those who have strayed into the glorious dwelling place of divine love. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sea and the dry land, molded by the Creator's imagination, that we may cherish the gifts that they bring forth and be good stewards of their fragile ecosystems. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sin of division may be lifted from family life and from whoever it fractures the bond, wherever it fractures the bonds of affection and, move, and movements towards peace. That forgiving what is past and trusting in God's future, 
we may work to reveal the kingdom in our time. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That the righteous dead may live into eternal life, and those who have gone astray may receive the mercy of the Maker. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the reign of Christ over all creation, let us continue our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Almighty God, source of all that is, giver of every good gift, you create all people in your image and call us to love one another as you love us. We confess that we have failed to honor you in the great diversity of the human family. We have desired to live in freedom while building walls between ourselves and others. We have longed to be known and accepted for who we are while making judgment of others based on the color of skin or the shape of features or the varieties of human experience. We have tried to love our neighbors individually while yet benefiting from systems that hold those same neighbors in oppression. Forgive us, holy God. Give us eyes to see you as you are revealed in all people. Strengthen us for the work of reconciliation rooted in love. Restore us in your image to be beloved community, united in our diversity, even as you are one with Christ and the Spirit, holy and undivided Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food of, and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, Bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for you, the people of God. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ, proclaim your resurrection, and await your coming in glory. And since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. Amen. God's blessing be with you. Christ's peace be with you. The Spirit's outpouring be with you, now and always. Amen. And now let us go out into the world to love and serve the Lord.